in Viking Lander photographs, it was discovered that there was this weird looking structure that looks for all the world in the Viking photos like a face. Since our first glimpse of Mars as a celestial body in the night sky, the red planet has fascinated people. From the very beginning, the planet's scarlet tint distinguished it from its glinting brothers, all of which were fascinating in their own ways, but none of which traced a ruddy arc across the sky above Earth. At first, astronomers mistakenly believed that a thriving Martian civilization was responsible for the fascinating patterns and landscapes that telescopes first showed in the late 1800s. In the decades that followed, orbiters sent back much more precise data about the surface and atmosphere of the planet. Now, one of those missions has made a discovery after all, one that is so unlikely, contentious, and astounding that both NASA and the scientific community have denied it. Is Martian life still going strong, or did it ever evolve there? Come explore Mars with us as we uncover what decades of expeditions have shown that no one was supposed to see. We have scanned every planet from Mercury to Saturn, and maybe, just maybe, the general public held out hope that, with each new image, they might spot a metropolis, a McDonald's, or some other sign that we weren't alone. According to the Gallup poll, between 60% and 70% of the population believe that someone is out there and that we will discover them soon. However, recently, we discovered a group of objects that could represent proof of some unpublished images taken by the Viking spacecraft in 1976. Also, nobody seems to be paying attention to them, which is a major problem. We sent four Viking spacecraft to Mars in the summer of 1976 as part of the bicentennial celebration in an attempt to determine if we are indeed alone. The number of photos taken in orbit was staggering. Throughout the three or four years that the orbiters were operational, approximately 60,000 pictures were captured. We now have images of the entire surface of Mars down to about 10 meters of resolution, as well as selected areas down to about 100 meters of resolution. Not bad. And the original goal of those pictures was to locate a landing spot for the Viking craft. After that was accomplished, the mission shifted to mapping, to map Mars with as much detail as possible. The first Viking orbiter captured a frame in the northern portion of the planet called Cydonia, at approximately 41 degrees north latitude on July 25th as part of one of these mapping series. And it traveled through a number of steps, including the spacecraft, the ground antennas, the computers, and finally, the imaging facility, where scientists could view it alongside all the others. One Sunday afternoon, imaging team member Toby Owen was examining a collection of mosaic Polaroids under a microscope when he came upon a peculiar-looking mesa that resembled a human face on frame 35A72. Going without saying, that no one is expecting to see a mile-wide human face on Mars. After a brief exclamation of, wow, that's really strange, it was subtly disregarded. It plainly couldn't be true. Even in the most fantastical science fiction, it failed to conform to any conceivable paradigm. A mile-wide face on Mars has never been written about, except maybe by Arthur C. Clarke. As an ineffable enigma, Clark gave Mars a human face in a short fiction he penned in the early 1970s. Even though the one we're dealing with is a mile tall and his face is only eight inches tall, Arthur's footprints are everywhere in this story. He has visited numerous locations where subsequent visitors arrive. If Arthur still hasn't gotten the hang of it, it could be because there is a human face where no human face has any business being. That was the main reason why the Viking imaging team, including Toby Owen, chose to disregard it. It didn't conform to the norm. It wasn't until 1979 that two workers, Vince DiPietro and Gregory Moliner, were perusing the records of the National Space Science Data Center in Washington, D.C. during their lunch break. As Vince flipped over a glass iron envelope, he beheld the face peering back at him. It was mind-blowing for him, for the simple reason that he had written it off as a hoax after reading an Ancient Astronauts magazine article about it in 1977. Now fast forward to 1979, and there it is, seemingly authentic, 
in a NASA file. Well, Vince realized the connection. Alongside the resounding announcement from NASA that the search for life was the impetus behind Viking, he couldn't help but be captivated by this face that had a striking resemblance to life, particularly the kind of life that we are familiar with and can comprehend. Out of nowhere, the two images blended into one, and he thought, well, why haven't they done anything more with this obviously lifelike image except put it in the file, if they were seeking life? To find out what this face was, he sought relevant studies, geology, and geomorphology, and no luck. He and his friend Greg, who has a combined 30 years of experience in computer imaging, decided to do something no one had ever done before apply their knowledge of computers to this poor quality image in the hopes of extracting more detail. They borrowed equipment for a few months and applied the same procedure to this single image that NASA, in all honesty, applied to the other selected space photos we've seen in the past 25 years. Upon completion, they possessed an image like the poster shown at the entrance. That face was just jaw-dropping. Its proportions were just like those of a human face, including a mouth, eyes, hair, nose, and even features under the eyes. Aesthetically, it was pleasing to the eye. The effect that a face has as it peers out from the frame at you is something that artists work for years to produce. It's not just another face, as one of our analysts put it years later. You can only make out the left side of the subject in this shot because of the extremely low sun angle. The humanoid-looking albedo markings and features were either raised relief or just lights and darks on the flat surface. However, the creature's long shadow to the southeast indicated that it had substantial relief, so they couldn't be sure. After digging through the full Viking dataset, file by file, frame by frame, Vince and Greg discovered a second series of images captured over the same area 35 days later, at a different angle of the sun. Surprisingly, the face remained intact at a 20-degree illumination change when they enlarged that frame. This is, without a doubt, an extraordinary bisymmetrical humanoid face. Obviously, one must wonder if it is an erosional illusion, or if it is man-made. But with these facts in hand, denying its existence is no longer an option. As it stands, bisymmetry is extremely rare outside of Earth's biological systems. The degree of bisymmetry is also an important consideration. The object is very bisymmetrical. After discovering all of this, Vince and Greg compiled their findings into a monograph titled Unusual Martian Surface Features, and in June of 1980, they gave a presentation to the American Astronomical Society in Baltimore, Maryland, detailing their findings. And they seemed to have the naivete to believe that NASA would promptly organize a Mars expedition to investigate. There was no change. Actually, they were unable to formally deliver their paper at a Mars conference in Boulder, Colorado organized by the planetary community, a subset of the entire NASA infrastructure, even though they attempted to do so three years prior. They instead presented it at a secret meeting that took place at two in the morning in a hotel room. Even back then, NASA treated it like a closed subject, just a game of light and shadow. This was either a complete waste of time or the most important discovery of the 20th century, if not of our entire existence on Earth. There is no middle ground. It either is or is not artificial. If it's not, it is not worth worrying about. If it is, it is imperative that we figure it out because it is out of place. Its presence, if it was made by someone, is trying very hard to tell us something extraordinary. You have to know your way around evolutionary biology as a whole, and the current paradigm in scientific debates on life's evolution to grasp the incredible. The singularity of the human race here is fundamental to a major paradigm shift. The apex of this line of thinking was expressed by a paleontologist from Harvard University named Gaylord Simpson in a 1964 science article titled the non-prevalence of humanoids. It's a contradiction in terms. It can't, but it does. Novel understanding emerges from such furnaces. Obviously, something we think we know given the data is wrong. Either it isn't there, or else our paradigm that says it cannot be there 
is in error. As you started to use straight edges, measures, and protractors, the complex's order and symmetry became increasingly apparent. There seemed to be a connection between the interior order and the face lying a few miles ahead of it. So this wasn't just a random assortment of rubbish. There was order. Now that we've taken a giant leap forward, 40 scientists from six different imaging groups are working tirelessly throughout the nation to determine whether we have indeed found the first concrete evidence that we are not alone. The proof isn't arriving to us through some tenuous radio connection. It's showing up on another planet as an incredible pattern that no one can explain. Because of that, trying to figure it out and settle on a social pronunciation has become a very challenging, and to be honest, fascinating, task. By analyzing this pattern of Martian objects, we are compelled to ask the fundamental question that all humans must face. How do we know what we know? That mystery has piqued my interest nearly as much as the others surrounding it. Who was there? Why were they there? What did they do there? And how are they related to us? Because trying to determine whether someone actually did it using this data is not a simple task. It is a first-order, non-trivial problem that raises numerous questions regarding pattern recognition, psychological projection, probability theory, geometry recognition, and the relative excellence of intelligence and nature. To start answering the question of whether this is a result of chance or design, we need to start using numerical probability. The fundamental point is, how can one distinguish the difference between geology and intellect when one observes this kind of order anywhere? What about the pyramid to the south? Oh, it's remarkable. The first set of images taken over the face photographed the pyramid, but at such a low sun angle that it wasn't really possible to see what it was. The second set of images taken 35 days later at the higher sun angle showed this very strange looking massive pyramid southwest of the face, about 10 miles away. Three short sides and two long sides make up the five-sided symmetrical figure with buttresses in each of the five corners. The proportions of the figure are 1 ratio 1.6, which fits perfectly with Da Vinci's man, standing with his arms outstretched and his feet apart. Da Vinci was describing an earlier Italian discovery that human proportions fit into a relation between the circle and the square. The origins of this can be traced to a series of sacred geometrical discoveries that date back to a very ancient time, possibly to the Sumerians or even earlier, but certainly to the Greeks and Egyptians. Furthermore, the Pyramid of Di Pietro and Molinare wasn't carelessly dropped onto the Martian surface. Seated there, it is pointed directly at the face, the central trilon, or buttress, which would stand in for the bisymmetrical figure's head is 10 miles north of the face, as if someone were attempting to emphasize the presence on the Martian landscape within 10 miles of each other, of a perfectly humanoid face, and then a ratioed representation, or schematic, of the human form. What are the odds that the ratios would be humanoid for that pyramid? What are the odds that a humanoid pyramid would be aligned with a humanoid face? Perhaps the planetary community is blind to this because it isn't happening the way it should. The vast majority of science fiction authors are disregarding this since it doesn't fit into any of their fantastical scenarios involving extraterrestrial contact. It was always going to be something else, like a mirror when we first discovered artifacts in space. The aliens, or them, were meant to be involved. No matter how often we ignore it, the fact that it is us means that it is attempting to teach us something. Because the conditions of any contact with extraterrestrial intelligence will have a tremendous influence on suitable objectives for life on Earth, people's most conservative beliefs and values are drawn out when the subject of alien life, particularly intelligent life, is raised. Up until we encounter an external intelligence, the aliens reveal more about ourselves and it's not necessarily a positive reflection. We have already politicized them. Many people have already decided what the alien cannot be and the reasons for this span the entire ideological spectrum, from conservatism to liberalism. So the face on Mars is not free to be like the Easter Island statues or the Sphinx or any other artificial megalith. Instead, it has to be like the Von Daniken legend behind those structures. That is, 
a mirage, a fabrication. The additional fact that the structure in question is on another planet means that not only do its makers have to be explained away, but its very artificiality has to be denied first in order to do so. Another issue with the entire humanoid thing is that it implies an archetypal force in the cosmos, which is currently highly unpopular. There must be a fundamentally humanoid structure in the natural world if humanoids have evolved in other places as well. Consequently, the presence of a humanoid on a planet immediately adjacent to Earth raises two very troubling possibilities, according to the scientific worldview of the progressive liberals. Either you're implying that this planet and its solar system are home to extraterrestrial beings, or that there is an inherent humanizing force in the cosmos, both of which go counter to the atheistic foundations of science. In that case, you are verging on spiritualizing the cosmos. If the second is true, you're endorsing the whole ancient astronaut fringe, which contemporary astronomers find repulsive. There is also a hint here of Francis Crick's theory that we ourselves, because of the particular chemistry of our molecules, are more like the offspring of outer space people than indigenous evolved creatures of the Earth. Because it runs counter to abstract generalizations, the face cannot be a tangible object or event, even if it exists. Now why are we supposed to be convinced that this is real? Well, it's pretty clear. We need to fly there and land before we can decipher the message. Our current subject matter consists of very few bits, the Viking drawings. But these would also be the first bits that a burgeoning technological society would encounter. Actually, a face is perfect. A face says, if you are smart enough to find me, then you are smart enough to know I don't belong here. And if you know I don't belong here, then you know I'm not them. I'm you. There couldn't be any more clear statement of come and see me. The message and the form are both beautifully executed. A profound and connotative statement in cosmic language that transcends the enormous chasm that separates us from them. If you sort of imagine the scenario of life evolving on a planet, developing technology, reaching up, this sounds very Sagan-esque, right? Reaching out into its neighborhood stellar system and exploring its neighborhood worlds. The first thing it's going to do is take a lot of pictures. If you wanted to communicate something to this nascent species, the most cost-effective way to do it is to leave something in a place where they will eventually stumble across it on a scale big enough for them to find it from space. Because covering a whole planet is no triviality. It takes a lot of pictures to cover a planet, so the scale has got to be big enough for one to see it and daughter it to last. Then there was another controversial aspect, this one based on speculation rather than evidence. Very rudimentary in appearance is the face with its high sun angle. Additionally, we have superimposed the highlight angle face with reconstructions of the skulls of Homo erectus, who ran about this area half a million years ago. In fact, you can conduct an overlay and observe an astounding similarity between the two, measured from the length of the chin to the width of the brow, the forehead to the brow, the location of side features, and so on. That is quite intriguing. Is it just a coincidence that the most sophisticated species here was Homo erectus, the last time the sun came up on Mars? Or is there more to it than that? We will need to return to Mars to discover that answer, naturally. The ultimate goal of all robotic endeavors is to prepare the way for human colonization of another planet. Orion, the spacecraft now under development by NASA, will carry humans to the moon and beyond. And the agency has set the 2030s as a realistic target for landing humans on Mars. Additionally, private spaceflight firms like SpaceX are joining the Mars race. Soon, in one way or another, Earthlings may find out if our neighboring planet ever supported life and if our species has any chance of survival in other worlds. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.